Well, I guess the essence of it is first establish exactly what we shouldn't be doing and uh, stop doing anything that might be exacerbating the problem. And from then, we'd start developing on what alternative land uses we can, we can use, what options, what strategies that we can apply that might uh, ameliorate the problem or even um, redress it. But every farmer has got unproductive soil, and whether it be saline or waterlogged type country or deep sand that's totally unproductive for conventional farming, don't farm it. It's simple as that, and fence it out. The first thing to do is to fence it out, and it will never cost you any more money. Originally, it was low growing type of scrub, and to grow tall trimbers in that type of an environment seemed rather difficult. But um, with our experimenting with Western Australian type trees, it certainly proved that they will grow here. Any change to be effective has got to be economically driven. There isn't time for groups of people to go out on weekends and planting trees here and there. It's got to be a whole, a broad acre change in, in the way people farm. And that has to be driven by the returns to the farmer. And that has to be within three or four years. Otherwise, there is no incentive to do it. Now, farmers have a lot of time, quite often, thinking on a tractor. They've got ideas. They've got very good ideas. Uh, just a little bit of support and assistance. Uh, the time, which is important, and the available money, right, to do things. Uh, pull those things together around a table or out in the paddock, preferably, with ideas from everywhere, and you'll find a very good plan develop. And it will get done because it's the farmer's plan. If you intend to replan your whole farm, then a lot of time and research will give you something like this. And after that, all you have to do is to bring your ideas to life. Nothing much at all. Actually, it's a lot easier than that, because most farmers are improving their farm all the time if they can. The advantage of the plan is that it brings all your ideas together, and from that, you can develop a works program. Getting a plan into action means setting priorities. In some cases, this can be trees, others, water needs, or perhaps refencing. Sometimes, people get hung up on trees at the expense of their immediate production needs. This is uh, great for the land, but it can be awful for cash flow. First of all, consider your enterprises and what alternative land use could work on your farm, especially with a new layout based on different land types. Farmers are trying different sorts of stock on the one grazing operation. Woodlots on areas not normally used for grazing or cropping. Splitting crop production with pastures or planting salt tolerant pasture species. In addition, farmers are developing alternative forms of income which stem from their farms. A seedling business in the shed or machinery ideas that have application elsewhere. The Head Brothers in the Wimmera have had so much success with their medic wheat rotation that they've developed a prospering medic seed operation. Similarly, Peter Waldron uses his knowledge of local woods to sell red gum to wood carvers and as house stumps, even though his mates think he's a bit strange buying their old fence posts. most farmers ask is how can I afford to farm plan when I have so many other costs. As we've said before, whilst the Potter farms have undergone enormous change in five years, this work was accelerated to provide models. Farm planning doesn't necessarily mean spending more money than usual. What it does mean is that you spend your money and time more efficiently. Many farm planners argue that not having a plan is more costly, as it can mean poor use of your land resource, and often creates problems in the long term, which will require expensive works anyway. But the potter is not saying it's all got to be done in three years like ours was. Mm. It's saying that we have to have a plan which will be carried out in whenever it can be done. That's the important That's message, the important I think, so. yeah. The message from the demonstration farmers is pretty clear. You can, at the very least, 
have a plan and base your normal maintenance budget on that plan. It might mean that complete change takes 20 years or even more, but it's a step in the right direction. Well, look, how much can you afford to let go back to native scrub and still keep up your gross income? Maybe 10%. I don't think we know yet, but it's, it's so valuable, I'm quite sure that we've got to hang on to any that we've got. And we've got to try and revegetate as much as we can until we, we can see just what we do need on our farms. It's early days yet. The demonstration farmers see the replanning works as so critical that they've incorporated them into their normal annual budgets. A farm plan will cost a couple of hundred dollars and that money will be saved many times over when you relocate your first fence into the right place, simply by the immediate improvement in production. I think the financial plan <coughs> is probably the most important of the lot. Um, you know, to do your financial budgeting and, and each year, so that then all the others get tied into that, so that your, your planting and your farm budget go, in, go into your actual financial budget. Yeah. So, and that's <coughs> one, I think one of the critical things that, that we really need to look at, that, that the redesigning and the works program that you're putting in each year to help reduce your land degradation become part of the yearly budget. So it's not something you think of at the last minute, it's something that's it's something like your shearing or your dipping or your summer drenching. You do all those things because they need to be done at a certain time of the year. If, if you're running into bad times, be it, be it drought or seasonal or whatever, and, and what farmers tend to do is, is to put their farm on to hold when things become financially tight. And, and that would, because it's a part of your normal, now part of your normal farm operation, it goes on to the same sort of thing as all the other operations and, and it gets scaled down by the same degree. Unless you've got uh, a commitment to do it within yourself and you can reallocate some resources to that program. But I don't see anything wrong with scaling it down during those times that are a bit hard because the whole thing is cyclical and it, it'll turn around again and it won't be long before, as long as you remember to upgrade it when, you, when times become a bit better again. In his work as project manager, Andrew Campbell was ably assisted by Project Officer John Marriott and the two of them were instrumental in motivating and guiding the farmers and they're a great model for other consultants. There's nothing like uh, doing a budget to crystallise the priorities, is there? When you no. start working out where the dollars are going to go, that's when you sort out, well, I really need to do this more than this and, and what are the benefits? I, it wasn't only the, the financial budgeting, it's the physical budgeting of what you can physically handle during the year is very yeah, important that's right. too. That's yeah. very encouraging now, uh, three, or four, three years down the track, to come back and see that these blokes are still doing mm. nearly the same amount of work without any financial uh, assistance yeah. and that's because they're used to it now. Because they're planning their workload, you yeah. know, they fit in a bit of fencing in between shearing and other jobs and, uh, and they're, then they're in a position to plant at the appropriate time of the year and so yeah. on. So. Right. That's what we're aiming for really, is to get these long-term, ecologically sound farm improvement works to become a standard part of the farm operation, not mm. an afterthought when wool prices are up or there's a bit of handy cash around. The other important aspect of that, of course, is, is to make your program so that it's as maintenance-free as possible, because uh, you know, a lot of these works, you don't want to be creating a monster that you've then got to look after uh, forever and a day. Uh, you need to be able to uh, finish that particular project and then move on to the next project as, uh, as time permits. If you're costing some planning measures, there's no one rule about the best way to go. But always try to be flexible. Consider the savings of electric fencing. Consider the savings of direct seeding. Whilst direct seeding doesn't return trees as quickly as tube stock planting, it's by far the cheaper, and a more natural system anyway. As with all jobs, research your ideas to see if there's a more efficient way to go. We're not trying to provide the answers for your farm. That's the responsibility of every individual farmer. But the rules of researching, Asking questions, consulting with your associates and professional people are the basis of any good business. Things like planning and talk seem so intangible in the demanding business of farming. But in many ways, 
that have been the key ingredients in the special achievements that the farmers have reached in their demonstrations. The series we've presented has attempted to offer a constructive guide to sustainable production. To show how farming needs to incorporate the land's natural cycles if it's to maintain the soil resource. This understanding includes the relationship between trees and the water table, between plants and insects and fauna, the pattern of diversity which is nature's trademark. the influence trees and grasses can have on the use of rainfall, the effect trees can have on wind and the temperature of the air. Having a deeper understanding of the land means that replanning your farm can be organised to include these natural cycles. It'll mean better land management, which will mean higher returns. The series looked at the use of an aerial photograph as a base map for your plan to work from the natural features of your block. The first and most important stage is to replan your paddocks into single land types. By this we mean that your paddock doesn't have a creek running through it, or two soil types in it, or a salted gully joined with your healthy soil. You can then manage the grazing or cropping far more efficiently. And it means that fragile or degraded areas can be separated for individual treatment. Once you've arrived at a basic layout, look at designing a laneway which could reach each unit. Ironically, on the Potter farms, whilst the farmers have greatly increased the number of paddocks on their places, they've greatly reduced the amount of work time it takes to move stock or themselves around the place. Having completed a laneway on the plan, you have to start thinking about the water movement on the farm. Thinking about collecting cleaner water, filtering it as it runs into your dams, and about lowering the water table wherever necessary. Also, using shelter belts to slow the movement of water, as the potter farmers say, to use rain where it falls. Much of this involves the careful planting of trees and shrubs, because they are nature's major structure for holding the living soil together to sustain the life system. Likewise with wind, we looked at effective shelter belts, either through tube stock or direct seeding. There's no one formula for getting trees established. It really depends on the growing conditions and the species you try. But trees will grow in most places if the right formula can be found. Having dealt with trees, the next film looked at your paddocks and how important it is to develop healthy soils. Firstly, to treat each land type separately and to consider alternative land uses. To have a diverse range of species working the soil. To carefully till the soil. If necessary, to break the compaction so water and plants can rejuvenate the nutrients. And perhaps the final consideration, if you wish to replan your farm, is to encourage your neighbours in the catchment to do the same thing. Degradation is not an isolated problem. It knows no legal boundaries or land titles. The responsibility of protecting our farmland has to be shared. I've seen a, a real change in since the project started in, in farmers becoming aware, not just through the Potter example, but more generally of the need to think very seriously about where we're going in the long term. This is caused by a couple of things. Firstly, the, the growing environmental movement right across the world doesn't leave farmers untouched. And secondly, farmers' terms of trade are declining. The cost of their inputs is going up, and the cost of their outputs is it's fluctuating, but it's on a long-term decline. So there's a real need to make sure that the way in which a farmer interacts with the land is going to be productive into the future, and that's forcing farmers to plan more. As a little example, Andrew Campbell's work in managing the demonstration project gave him a tremendous insight into farm planning, and he's now moved into a new position 
as the national facilitator of land care groups right around Australia. There's, there's really been an explosion in farm planning activity over the last five years around Australia. We're seeing uh, farm planning short courses run by government departments, by private consultants, by TAFE and others uh, in South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria uh, and Queensland and something which is really heartening for me to see. We're seeing a genuine demand from farmers and from land care groups around Australia who want to get involved in farm planning. It's now becoming uh, one of the most common activities, farm and catchment planning. The land care movement's obviously one of the most exciting things happening in Australian agriculture at the moment. It's more than doubled in the last 12 months. Uh, so by the end of 1990, we'll probably have around 600 groups and between 15 and 20,000 farmers involved around Australia. And to me, land care and farm planning are complementary. There's no point uh, uh, slogging your mental energy and, and, uh, and you're back out doing a farm plan and implementing it if neighbours aren't, aren't involved. Like anyone else, farmers learn by doing. Uh, that's a very important part, but in exposing them to new ideas, uh, seeing something work effectively on another farm is very important, so that the over-the-fence learning is important, and also the uh, learning from other lead farmers, the opinion leaders within the farming community. Now, that can be backed up through external sources such as government departments and consultants and education and the, the whole suite of things, but I, I believe that the most effective ways in which farmers learn is by seeing something that they can relate to in their own paddock on their own place and apply it themselves. And that's where I think the demonstration farms have a terrific role to play. The real strength of the Potter demonstration project is that the farmers did their own plans and put them into practice. If the farmer is the planner, if he's tailoring the plans to his particular land and management style, then the process is underway. If in putting a plan together, ecological principles are incorporated, then you're able to look with optimism at the long-term production from your dirt. It's not a new idea. There's been individual farmers using their own intuition to read the land for generations. But they've remained individuals, or rebels that everyone chose to ignore because they did something differently. Australian farming has undergone numerous major changes in its 200-year history. One thing you can be sure of, the next major change will be farm planning. Potter is finished. Now, we've heard that uh, a few times. We heard it at the end of the uh, works phase, but it wasn't right, was it? Potter's still going strong. I heard it uh, said about tonight that, uh, look, this will be a sort of a wind-up for uh, Potter, but it won't be. I can guarantee it won't be. Potter is going to go on. It's going to, to demonstrate to the, this country the, the new direction uh, for agriculture. I've got an elderly, whoops, a mature friend uh, from uh, down south of here who, uh, whenever he sees me, which is not very often, but he says, uh, how's Bill Middleton's tree, pro uh, tree growing project going? Now this annoys me <laughs> immensely because it's not right. There's a far more to it than that. It's got to the point now where it amuses me and I just laugh at him and uh, try, I've given up trying to explain to him because he knows anyway, he's just baiting me. Why not use the, the tree? Let them talk about us as a tree growing uh, organisation, if you might say that, and then we'll convince them. Once we've got their attention, we'll convince them that we're, we're on about sustainable agriculture. That tree is going to be with us for hundreds of years. Now, Potter was a brilliant idea truly was a brilliant uh, concept. It has been just so successful, but it was thought out in the first place. Real farms were used where it, it had to uh, go, or we went out backwards. We have point, pointed Australian agriculture in a new direction. And I think we'll, we'll continue uh, agriculture in a, a sustainable way. Uh, form and 
that symbolic tree that I spoke of will continue to grow for many hundreds of years.